Our second speaker is one that you might already know. He's continually active in our community. Uh, these days you will find him working on topics like how to build data science teams, uh, operationalizing AI, or data science on graphs and more. So it was a tough choice to pick just one topic for tonight. We settled on automated machine learning or auto ML. So please welcome Paco Nathan. Paco, are you there? Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Snare to um, uh, Wonderful. Uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, present here. And uh, uh, thank you very much to IBM for, for sponsoring. I, I've been uh, uh, helping out with the IBM data science community for a while, and uh, it's uh, it's very active. Um, we, we've had some some wonderful events, and uh, always a lot of ongoing discussions. Um, this talk here is a survey about AutoML. Uh, I'll start with the slides here in a moment, but um, just to give a little bit of background. Um, you know, this, this field is interesting. It's been developing for a while. Uh, we can definitely point back to some very key papers about a decade ago, taking a look at, say, Stephen Boyd's work at Stanford on ADMM uh, and the whole idea of leveraging convex optimization to come out with, uh, you know, optimal models. Um, and, and there was similar work by, uh, you know, Amit Talwalker and, and others, uh, following up on that. Um, so uh, this field has been emerging. It's largely about using machine learning uh, to have better machine learning, I think is, is probably a good way to put it. Uh, about three years ago, my, my colleague and co-author, uh, Ben Lorica, who's a gradient flow. Uh, ben, of course, used to lead uh, the O'Reilly AI conference and uh, Strata Data Conference and others. Um, Ben had asked for more of a, a business overview of what was going on in this space. And so I'd, I'd done a report, done some talks, and you know, we'd published a little bit about it. Uh, but then uh, early last year, um, my, my friends at IBM, my colleagues, also my co-author, uh, Will Roberts, uh, you know, they asked, let, let's take a little bit more of a hands-on perspective um, and really focusing on the open source and showing people uh, a lot of pointers toward how to get started in this area. And, uh, and of course, since then, in the past couple of years, uh, this area has really taken off. So the talk today is more of an introduction uh, coming from the perspective of being a developer or a data scientist, um, what's going on in this field and, and really, you know, what are the ideas and the key points? Um, because I think that there's been, uh, how shall I say politely, a lot of marketing. And so a, a lot of information that maybe isn't quite the most balanced. So I want to try to just bring out like, what are the issues and where are some really great resources if you want to get started? And so having said that, uh, let me... I'll share my entire desktop uh, just because I want to be able to switch back and forth between the presentation and uh, maybe also uh, some views um, on, on a web browser. Um, okay, so what's presenter? All righty, can you see that okay? Good, okay, great. Um, well, first off, thank you very much to IBM Data Science Community. Um, and uh, here's a link for me if you want to get a hold of me on Twitter or, or web page at Darren. Um, you know, to, to talk about AutoML, um, first off, I want to throw out this idea, and it's really conceptual, uh, but the idea is you probably have a gradient problem. So when we're talking about machine learning, especially when we look at supervised learning, but also other areas of machine learning, uh, we like to understand data in terms of gradients, differentiable gradients. And we could do a deep dive into the math and talk about manifolds and all oh, some of the theory on this. But at the end of the day, what we're talking about uh, are generally ways to learn from how to differentiate the data because it's arranged in some sort of gradient. And we create, on the one hand, features to really accentuate those kind of gradients. Uh, Nandita was showing a lot of that. I love the visualization of, of features, you know, going into some of the, the, the feature engineering in the previous talk. Um, but we also create learners and algorithms that are based off of loss functions and regularization, et cetera, uh, to be able to leverage the gradients. 
And so if we, if we take a look inside of uh, a really common example, let me switch to showing this notebook. Um, okay, this is just a, a very simple uh, example using iris. Uh, the data set of three different species of iris flower. It's, you know, a century old now. Um, uh, I just loaded it up from scikit-learn and then using NumPy and pandas, we'll load a data frame with the data set. And what you get are the species, which is a categorical variable uh, defining what you're trying to predict. And then you get four different columns of links and widths and whatnot of, of parts of the flower. Now, if we visualize that, uh, we can take a look using Seaborn and we can see that the three different species, when visualized based on some of these features, it's differentiated. Um, you know, definitely when you look at, at, at some of these, they have more predictive power than others, but like for instance here, looking at petal width versus petal length, you can really see how the three different species are sort of spread out spatially. Um, and when we're training machine learning algorithms, of course, this is what we're using, is that kind of, of differentiation. Um, and just here's a, a real simple example of uh, building a test and train set in scikit-learn and then running a random forest classifier, uh, training that. And you know, the decision when you're, when you're working with supervised learning, typically there's some sort of parameters. And so in the case, uh, well, actually, with the random forest, you, you're going to choose how many trees you're going to have. Um, that's the main parameter that you're trying to decide. So um, the idea with random forest is if you have only one tree, it's just sort of defaults into being a decision tree. Uh, if you have a lot of trees, then you can capture a lot of edge cases, so to speak. And you also have some nice benefits of out of band error, being able to predict what the accuracy of the model is as soon as it's trained. Um, a, a lot of great properties out of random forest. So if we plot uh, here, let's pick a lot of uh, a range of different values for that parameter, the number of trees. Then we can also plot what is the, the loss, uh, taking accuracy score. Um, what is the loss uh, that we're seeing? What kind of accuracy or predictive power are we seeing out of this algorithm? And it's interesting with random forest, you know, if you keep throwing more and more trees, you get better and better results out to a point. Uh, if you keep throwing a lot more trees, then eventually you start to see little hiccups like this, where you probably have too many trees going on, you're getting some other effects. Um, so yeah, we could probably pick like 15 trees would be good here. And that's visually, we're just eyeballing it. So the question is, can we train machine learning models to recognize that and automatically pick those kinds of parameters? Um, and that's a lot of the gist for, for at least parts of AutoML. Um, and let me zoom this kind of in the way of my screen. So let me see here. Okay. So with the iris data set here, if we look at say petal width versus sepal length, uh, just took, taking a look at, at two features, we can get a pretty good separation, a little bit of overlap. Um, but we have a learner, which is our random forest algorithm. There's a, a loss function. I won't go into the math too much, but um, the, basically the two parts of the algorithm are the loss function and the regularization term. Uh, we can define those. Then we can run a gradient descent algorithm to try to pull the pieces apart and train the learners to come up with a good model. Um, now, this is looking inside this algorithm. We have this notion of parameters versus hyperparameters. Uh, the hyperparameters are what I mentioned, the number of trees. That's something that you select when you're going to go and use some kind of machine learning algorithm. Um, there's also the notion of a parameter, which is what the learners, what the algorithm selects. Um, it's sort of the elements in the model for how it's learned to differentiate the gradient, how to predict the species. Uh, now, in the case of random forest, you know, we can determine based on how many trees we have, how many parameters there will be. Um, in, in terms of hyperparameters, it's really just the one. Um, for some of the older forms of uh, supervised machine learning, of course, there's usually not a lot of hyperparameters. Um, and you now there'll be some parameters here, but as we're getting into deep learning and, and really large architectures of neural networks, 
you know, we've been seeing these models that have a billion parameters and more. And now some of the latest coming out of OpenAI and Google and whatnot, we're seeing even trillion parameter models. Um, so uh, with just a few hyperparameters, we can create some pretty big models. That means that there's a pretty large decision space there in terms of how those are selected. Um, now, this is a generalization. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but I wanted to we wanted to compare a bit about different forms of machine learning. Um, certainly with, with supervised learning, you're differentiating gradients of uh, uh, input features to try to predict some sort of label or some sort of value. So you have independent and dependent variables. With unsupervised learning, it's much the same. Uh, it's just that you really don't have the labels to work with. The algorithm is generating proxies for that. So, you know, a, a very well-known form of unsupervised learning, of course, would be like clustering. K-means clustering is an example. And instead of having labels, you have cluster centers, um, which are, are sort of proxies for that. Um, active learning is a really super interesting area. There's Unfortunately, active learning is used in a couple different ways, but for machine learning, uh, it's it's where you have human in the loop uh, with supervised learning. Um, you know, effectively, you can you can leverage the uncertainty uh, that the model is highlighting, spotlighting. Uh, you can basically search for regions of uncertainty in your training set, and then when there's a high enough threshold, kick out uh, the the judgment, the decision to an expert who will then label that data point and uh, provide it as feedback and you can train with, with more data that way. Um, there's also a notion of self-supervision, which is to say, I have a complex object and I want to build machine learning models to recognize it. Can I sample parts of the object and use that to predict other parts of the object? So as far as machine learning models concerned, parts are known and parts are unknown. Um, so I'm kind of hiding parts of my data to, to be able to construct something that's like unsupervised learning, but then shift it over into more supervised learning. And self-supervised pipelines are really interesting. Facebook's been doing these a lot. Uh, they're, they're very interesting applications in AI for this, especially when you start to have multiple modes. Uh, you, know, you might have some text, you might have some image, uh, you might have other kinds of data coming in all about the same objects. But all of these are leveraging different types of gradients to distinguish. And of, of course, you know, there's also deep learning, which is a kind of supervised learning. Uh, I made the mistake about 40 years ago of, uh, you know, people warned me against it, but I, I went into a field called machine learning in graduate school. And then I was also warned to stay away from something, but I, I made the mistake further of studying a topic called neural networks. And uh, I was fortunate I got to do a lot of uh, R&D work in neural networks, including hardware acceleration back in the 80s and 90s. Um, it's really outstanding to see how much neural networks have taken off, um, you know, but this is a way of, of differentiating our input. Um, reinforcement learning is another area I really love working in. Um, and the idea there is it's, it's really an application of optimal control theory, but then it has deep learning bolted on to be able to learn the edge cases. It's probably pretty good to say it. You're going to have one or more agents that are working within an environment. The environment may be simulated, it may be real, but at the end of the day, you've, you're training policies to recognize, again, these different gradients and how to get back to a more of an optimal kind of, of uh, uh, performance. Weak supervision is another area, uh, really interesting. And when you see projects like Snorkel uh, that are leveraging this of sort of how can we create mathematical functions to describe our human experts who are labeling data. And then when we train, figure out the error. And again, look at those gradients and figure out which experts are good with particular cases, not so good with others. So how can we turn human judgment into a kind of mathematical uh, labeling function? And then again, apply machine learning on that gradient. Uh, on and on. There's a lot of areas. Uh, I do a lot of work in knowledge graph. Maybe we'll talk about that at a different day, but it's a nice way to complement what's going on in supervised learning or, or self-supervised learning even uh, by having the context. Um, and the last part, it, it's a bit slippery. The definition meta-learning is something that's maybe not as well-defined. It's still much more of an active research topic, but the idea there is uh, what can we learn from our past? Um, the idea being that as say we're working in a data science team 
as we're going and working with some organizations data, training models, deploying them, collecting feedback from ML ops about how the models perform, as we have some history collected over time, when we're confronted with a new problem, we have to go build more machine learning to, to help you know, solve that problem. Can we learn from our past? Uh, can we do some data mining on our machine learning history and, and sort of pull a lot of the pieces together to be able to construct better, better training, better models? So meta learning is, is kind of something that pulls these together. Um, and yeah, okay, so you know, typically there, there may be some human loop aspects or some weak supervision. You may be using databases or knowledge graph for context, um, but it, it's really interesting where the scope of meta-learning is going with respect to AutoML. And so um, the second part of this is, you know, when you roll the clock back to the definitions of AI that were being used in the 70s and 80s, and, uh, and I'm old enough to have been in grad school back in the 80s, early 80s. Uh, you know, we used to talk about AI as search. And so you, you, you look up, you know, some of the old papers and discussions, you'll, you'll see a lot about A star and B star and search strategies. And, and I can tell you that at, at Stanford Computer Science, you know, in the, in the AI, work that was going on there in the 80s, it was just always talking about search and heuristics. It's probably no small wonder that, you know, one of the spin-offs that came out of that uh, department was a, a little company called Google focusing on search. Um, so at the end of the day, when we're working with machine learning workflows, we really encounter a lot of search problems. Um, you know, the challenge of building machine learning models finding the best hyperparameters for a given use case, given set of data. It's not a simple task. It's not something that's particularly linear. There's a lot of nonlinear effects and, and complexities that can come in. A lot of challenges, especially when we start thinking about security and privacy, fairness and bias, compliance, and a lot of these other issues. Um, so there's a challenging search problem when we're working with machine learning workflows uh, and, and a lot of questions that need to be asked. Um, by the way, I'm going to have a lot of links in the slides and I'll provide a PDF for the slides. So hopefully there's some good resources and some questions you can use later on. But anyway, there's a number of questions whenever we're working with machine learning. And so if we think about formulating this as a search problem, how can we answer these questions and resolve these, these different caveats and concerns? Um, that's a guidance toward how can we use AutoML? What if it were possible to look at all the different variations of the input data, all the different possible variations of the hyperparameters, et cetera, and then search efficiently within those to find how do we train models best for a given situation? So that's a search problem, and that's what AutoML effectively is addressing. So, you know, find the appropriate hyperparameters, identify features and data transformations that produce optimal training sets, um, and learn from your history, being able to have feedback loops within your workflow and your process. Uh, and, you know, there's other considerations coming in too. I, I don't know if you've seen, but this is really fascinating uh, on a couple fronts. Um, energy and policy considerations, uh, for instance, some of the large transformer models with deep learning, turns out that, you know, they have approximately five times the lifetime carbon footprint of an average automobile uh, just to train them. Um, so there's a lot of interesting issues. Uh, do we really want to boil the ocean and pump carbon in the atmosphere um, just to have slightly incrementally better machine learning models? Probably not. We want to be cognizant of that. Also, there's the matter of other trade-offs in machine learning model because, yeah, I can cr keep creating billion and trillion parameter models to have, you know, a thousandth of the percentage better accuracy. Yeah, I can do that. But you know, how much carbon do I burn? How long does it take before I can deploy something in front of a customer? You know, what are the resources required for this in terms of cost? Um, there's a lot of trade-offs and sometimes simpler algorithms can be better for a given case. There was research yesterday showing the use of unsupervised graph techniques versus GPT-2 for being able to understand uh, essentially claims within text where the, the, the much smaller algorithms ran three to four uh, orders of magnitude faster and had better results. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I do want to underscore there's a lot of trade-offs and this is a complex space. And, and certainly when you get into areas of like fairness and bias, uh, there's some great resources, AI360, also explainability, AIX360, um, a lot of areas of trust there to consider. 
Um, and you know, the other thing that really uh, astounds me when you when you look at machine learning, I hear a lot of people talk about accuracy. And, and in fact, I see a lot of vendors where they describe they can give you the best accuracy possible. But then when you go to evaluate what they're what they're talking about, you know, they'll just have like one kind of metric that they're measuring, or, or maybe two. You know, technically speaking, when I talk about accuracy with respect to machine learning, really, I could break that down into at least four different areas of precision and recall, specificity, perplexity, and then you get aggregate scores like F1 that are weighted out. So, you know, it, it, it's really complex. And accuracy alone is not really what you want. You, you want confidence versus uncertainty in terms of your, your predictive results. You want to understand how much money you're going to spend. Uh, and you know there will be diminishing returns in terms of money, in terms of time. You want to understand about scalability and resource footprint, privacy, security, compliance, et cetera. So uh, trying to find the best machine learning model is not easy. Um, so in practice, actually, there's a note here about uh, life cycle, but um, let me just show here, <clears throat> the idea is, let's talk about kind of an idealized uh, machine learning workflow. Uh, say that you've, you've got some data preparation. Of course, we always spend a lot of time doing that. It's super important. And then we go into feature engineering. Feature selection is also difficult. It's a very hard, provably hard problem. And then from there, once we can say we've got our features, we've built our training sets, then we can go out and train optimized learners to you know, run the algorithms to, to build the models. But then we also have a very provably hard problem of evaluating the results of models because they aren't always apples to apples comparison. And then even once you have a model or an ensemble of models selected, um, there's, there are issues in terms of integration and deployment. Because if you're going into something that's say, edge device or low power, you know, you may have to make trade-offs in your, in your algorithm just to be able to, to fit inside of the hardware that's required and the battery footprint. Or you may have auto scaling issues because you're deploying on a cluster, et cetera. So let's use this lifecycle model for a kind of blueprint and then compare where the auto ML features are emerging uh, with respect to these. Um, and by the way, I, I should mention also, there's, there's kind of a, 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 a three tier uh, or a three prong uh, evolution of things happening here because this, this notion of auto ML also intersects a lot with what's going on in data governance, but at the same time, it also intersects a lot with, with what's emerging in terms of MLOps practices. And those three are emerging together. Um, now, uh, I'm gonna be discussing, uh, you know, basically an aggregate of a number of different projects being reviewed. There's uh, a, a Google spreadsheet online that's open to the public if you wanna check it out. I've been trying over the past couple of years to keep track of the different open source projects in AutoML, as well as different vendors, and just, you know, keep a few notes about all of them. Um, and certainly, uh, if anything needs to be added, let me know. I'd love to, I'm trying to curate this and, and add more. So I'm sure there's probably some changes that are required even for what's shown there. Um, and uh, also, uh, you know, I'll mention that I'm, I'm drawing heavily from some other resources. I highly recommend this from Hydazian. Uh, there's something called Awesome Auto ML Papers, and it's updated, curated quite often, a really great visualization and sort of taxonomy of the different areas of what's going on, and then links out to a lot of the latest papers and projects. Okay. So having said that, let's look through this stage by stage. Um, first off, there's this area of our data preparation and in data science, preferably we spend 80% of our time here. And that makes sense. If, if I was at a hedge fund in finance, I would probably spend at least 80% of my time curating my portfolio. Um, similar thing in data science, you really want to curate your data. Now, there are some great examples of like Holoclean and Snorkel areas where uh, weak supervision is being leveraged to help automate some of the, the data preparation, data cleaning. And uh, so this is something that, that could have a lot of impact because again, so much of our time is spent uh, in this stage when we're working in uh, data science. So I've, I've got a, a couple of papers here that will be referenced, but uh, definitely taking a look at Holoclean, I think is something highly recommended. Um, and let me check, because I think I may see a question here. Uh, chat. 
Okay. Oh, great. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I just had to trick that out there. Um, if I go to the next stage, feature engineering, uh, the next stage in a typical in a life cycle, um, you know, this is where we have to pick out the features that really will define the gradients that we're trying to differentiate. And there can be effects between features. There can be nonlinear effects. It could be that the raw features just really don't show how to differentiate the data carefully, you may need to transform them first. And we don't need to go into the mathematics for that right now, but uh, it's a hard problem. Um, I definitely wanna recommend a few resources. Um, a couple of friends of mine, um, Alex Sheng and Amanda Kasari uh, have a, a really great book called Feature Engineering for Machine Learning, um, highly recommended. Um, and in terms of going uh, deep dive into the math for feature engineering, Alex, Alice is a world expert on that. So uh, highly recommended. Um, and I'd also wanna point out, there's a great paper, a uh, friend of mine at U Manchester, um, Gavin Brown is one of the authors on stability of feature se selection algorithms. Um, and it's really interesting because if you look at selecting features in a given data set as say the customer base is evolving over time as the data is evolving over time. Um, how can, statistically, how can you choose features to be more stable? In lieu of say, you know, every week I'm gonna train a new model and I'm gonna select different features uh, for whatever's best that week. Um, you know, that may be good for a point in time of increasing predictive power, but it's not good in terms of understanding model drift and other kinds of artifacts of machine learning and practice over time. So I think that um, this stability of feature selection algorithm uh, is really interesting and underused technique. Um, but there, there's some great points here in terms of feature engineering, auto ML toolkit, ML box and others are, are really highlighting that. Um, now, moving into the next stage where we train the models, we assume that we've got our training set or test set, we need to train our learners. Um, this is where we get into the hyperparameter optimization. And one thing I really wanna strongly clarify is when you talk about AutoML, some of the early discussions about AutoML were only about hyperparameter optimization. And there are still people out there who are fairly dogmatic saying that's all it is. Um, it's not true. There's much more than just the HPO, the, the hyperparameter optimization, and uh, and that and the other parts are maybe more recent. So that's one bit of misunderstanding I want to clear up in industry. This is super important. This is where you go and select the hyperparameters that you need to do, um, but it's not the entire problem. Um, it is one though that's very computationally intensive, and so there's some great examples here. Um, Hyperopt, Auto Keras is a little bit older, but Hyperopt, uh, Ray Tune is something newer. I do a lot of work with Ray, and uh, the, the Tune component of the course is, is very very important. So uh, there's a great article here. Stop doing iterative model development uh, from some of my friends over at Determined AI. I mentioned to meet Tallwalker uh, a little bit earlier. He had uh, pioneered uh, something called Paleo and, and also some earlier projects. Um, uh, Amit and I used to work together at Databricks and, and now he's got Determined AI. Um, okay, so HPO is kind of the heart of the thing. But once you've trained a bunch of models, now you need to understand, okay, I've trained them, but what do they really mean? What do the results really mean? How do I compare them? And, and there's some examples of this in Auto uh, Scikit-Learn. Um, I, I think that, you know, talking about ensembles is probably some of the better dialogue about this in industry, uh, combinations of multiple machine learning models. Of course, this is a very powerful technique, which was highly uh, accentuated during the Netflix prize competitions. Um, and then, you know, once you've got a model or an ensemble of models selected, now we need to look at what are some of the issues once you go to use it? And of course, this is where it starts to intersect a lot into MLOps practices. Um, but the fact is deploying models is hard. Um, once you deploy models, almost as soon as they're deployed, they start degrading. And uh, Ben Lark and I have a, a article, a report about that out that just came out today on gradient flow. Um, but you know, the, when you look at SageMaker and Watson Studio and, and, and some of the other kinds of services, um, they provide uh, really excellent resources in terms of auto scaling. Uh, but then, you know, maybe in the other direction, your machine learning models aren't going to be de deployed on a really large cluster in the cloud. Instead, they're going to be deployed on some battery-operated device that's, that's out in the field. And then you want to look at, at 
you know, low power kinds of situations. Maybe you need to do some sort of model distillation or other ways of, of shrinking the, the footprint of the model. And there are great techniques for that. Um, TensorFlow.js, I think uh, I'll, I'll shout out uh, to uh, some friends over there. Really fantastic work. Um, they are also some of the people doing the Tiny ML Summit. If you haven't seen that, that's an excellent conference when you're looking at low power ML, highly recommended. Um, okay, so taking a look, we have these different stages of what we can do. And, and there are some commercial properties. Um, again, shout out to IBM for helping to sponsor and, and donating to PyData. We're very grateful. Uh, when you look at some of the commercial offerings, some of them really do uh, try to be very mindful and considerate about this kind of end-to-end -end workflow perspective and, and offering features at every stage of the machine learning workflow to leverage AutoML kinds of features. So AutoML AI is one of the offerings out of Watson Studio. And underneath the hood, there, there is some open source that's helping to drive that. And we'll show some, some demos of that a little bit later. Um, now, looking ahead in terms of AutoML, um, I would say, you know, keep a close watch on this area of meta learning. It's still somewhat of a slippery definition, but it's, it's definitely uh, evolving very rapidly. Uh, there was a great survey paper that came out uh, about six months ago by um, uh, Hospitales et al. It's called Meta Learning in Neural Networks, a Survey. And, and there's a few others here that are really good, like overview sorts of um, papers I'd, I'd reference. Um, essentially, this is where we get into more of the workflow perspective of kind of semi-automated machine learning across the whole workflow. And there's some good examples of this in open source. Um, Teapot is one that really took a stab at that kind of automated data science notion. And Lale is another one. Uh, Lale is the one that I'm gonna show some examples of. And it's uh, some of the open source um, uh, coming out of um, IBM, um, Pascal Rosa, uh, and uh, others. And it's, it's part of what's driving the uh, auto AI offering. Um, you know, another thing that I, I really want to call out, and, and this is something that's not said a lot in the other literature, but um, there's a lot of overlap between this field of AutoML and what's happening in program synthesis. Um, and I, I really love this area of program synthesis, essentially using AI to generate code for a given kind of context. Um, and you can go back to, I mean, for instance, uh, Claire Ledoux, Claire Legu, who's uh, now at CMU, she had done really fascinating work on genetic algorithms, uh, genetic algorithm usage for uh, bug bounties uh, for uh, GitHub repos uh, at scale. Uh, really fantastic work on what can be done with program synthesis and basically learning concepts in one open source project, but then apply them to uh, fix secure, security vulnerabilities in other open source projects. Um, and you know that it kind of fits with the whole general trend of what we're seeing in say pre-commit hooks and a lot of like AST analysis of, of code. Um, I do a lot of Python uh, open source code and you know, we, we make use of uh, PyLint and, and other types of, of these sort of pre-commit tools um, which really intersect here. Um, so the idea is how can we use machine learning to augment how people create software? Um, and there's some great examples of this. Um, I, if you haven't seen it, definitely check out AutoPandas where you know, if you have some data frames in one shape and you need to get them into a required uh, other shape, uh, AutoPandas can create the Python code for you to do that. Um, and there's also you know, a lot of deep learning tools in this area. Tab9 has great examples in terms of uh, auto completion inside of IDEs. But this area of program synthesis, there's a lot going on. And, uh, you know, there's also some controversy. Um, there's a really fascinating uh, video that I'm linking here uh, about AutoML and some of the rationale. Uh, it's, it's Jeff Dean at Google talking about AutoML and how, you know, basically a lot of companies are facing um, challenges trying to hire enough AI experts. And so uh, the idea that was being floated is, well, we'll just make AutoML much better and then the companies would spend 100x more in cloud computation and not have to hire as many people. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, there's, there's a video of Google talking about this. It's, it's an interesting idea. And to some extent it's true, but not entirely true. I think there's still going to be a lot of jobs for AI experts. Um, the other thing though, is, you know, another 
kind of subtext that's going on is that hardware has been evolving very rapidly. And uh, I, I, will, I will show, I don't have a link, unfortunately, yet. They haven't published it. But uh, yesterday, we just got a new mini book out on Manning that's called uh, Hardware is, uh, actually, I can show this a little bit later. There's a, a new mini book out on Manning that Dean Wampler and I did working with some of the open source tech leads at NVIDIA, um, really understanding how to have good design patterns with idiomatic Python so that hardware can really optimize what your workflows are trying to do. And of course, this fits in very much with AutoML because it's so compute uh, intensive, but also in some areas, very bandwidth intensive. Um, okay, so a lot of resources here I highly recommend. Um, in conclusion, you know, mind the caveats, the ethical and policy considerations. There's a lot more than just optimizing hyperparameters. It's a much bigger field, a lot more implications. Um, and uh, definitely check out what's going on with hardware because there's a lot going on there. Um, so AutoML is a lot about basically training AI to improve AI. Um, now, having said that, let me shift over. I would like to show some examples of this um, based on the Lale project. The idea with the demos is I, I wanna point you towards some resources. I'm not going to run them because I am concerned that since I'm very remote, I'm out in the redwoods. Um, I don't want Zoom to interact with my CPU when I'm trying to run something. Um, so let me let me just talk through and show some of this. Um, so this is the Lale project, and if you go inside of Lale, um, I'm running this in Jupyter Lab. Um, actually, let me show Lale project is right here. Um, Lale is a Persian word. Uh, I'm half Persian. Uh, but it's also the name for a Python library for semi-automated data science. Um, and so anyway, I go into Lale and I go into the examples. And then there's a number of different uh, Jupyter notebooks that it, it show how to work with Lale. Um, I will show one here about uh, hyperparameter optimization. Um, and so let me describe this just real quickly. Lale is about creating a grammar to describe what you would like to see in a machine learning workflow. And then using Lale, uh, using AutoML to optimize uh, within those constraints. So how can it figure out the best selections at each stage of your workflow? So here, um, okay, what we do is we use a, a pipe as a kind of combinator uh, where you make a different choice uh, to select. So we'll start out a pipeline saying, we're either going to do a, a Nystrom or, or, or nothing at all as a first stage in data preparation. And then from there, we're going to have another stage where we look at, um, are we using logistic regression versus um, uh, key neighbors? Um, and then we'll take and visualize that. Um, and then we'll run some optimization on it. Um, and the idea is that you're using machine learning to look at this the different selections, the different points of the workflow until you can come out with, okay, what's best. Now I can visualize this. Um, another example would be here. Uh, okay, here's where we've got a top K classifier in scikit-learn and we're gonna throw in a few different options at different stages of the workflow. Um, so basically what we do is we wanna come out with uh, top K. We wanna come out with three different models that we use in Ensemble. Um, and we have different options that we can plug into those. And here you can see the different options being visualized by Lale. Um, and you run through and you do your training and it comes out with, okay, what are the best selections that we can have for building this ensemble? And similarly, um, you know, if you, if you wanna look at issues such as uh, fairness and bias, here's where you can do some, some integration of Lale, scikit-learn and AF360 um, to understand, do we have imbalance in the data sets? Are we introducing bias or using uh, protected classes uh, where we shouldn't be? And so here we can build up a, a pipeline that takes the bias issues into, into account as well as selecting what types of algorithms we should be using in the different stages. And you can see the visualization of what's being, being selected. 
Um, so I, I will throw that out there. Um, and then the other thing that I'll put out is a little bit of a plug. Uh, if you want to learn more about what's going on on the hardware side and how to do idiomatic Python uh, to really support a lot of, say, GPU optimization, but also scale out on CPUs, et cetera, um, there's a new mini book out. It's free. It's called um, Hardware is Greater Than Software is Greater Than, than Process, Data Science in the Post Moore's Law. Um, the other thing, let's see, definitely I'll, I'll put in a plug for automail.org and for um, awesome automail papers. Um, another thing that I'll put out a plug for is if you haven't seen Calm Code from Vincent Warmerdam, uh, you know, when you're talking about optimizing workflows and weak supervision and human in the loop, uh, Vincent's got some really great examples. Um, so at that, I will stop talking and uh, stop sharing the screen and get back into questions. Thank you, Paco. Are there questions um, from the audience? Feel free to unmute yourself and uh, speak to the speaker directly or ask the questions in the chat. And let me throw out a question too, to start out with. Um, have you tried using any auto AutoML tools? I'd love to hear some stories about if, if you've tried any of these out. I've tried using SageMaker and and, G, and GCP and uh, also Azure, and I'm not a great coder, and uh, I'm not wanting to be a great coder. I mean, I would like to be that, but uh, you know, it really kind of is amazing to me to get some pretty good results just by throwing some data in there. And you can kind of start with just throwing data in there and get an answer all the way up to being really specific about your code. And that's partly why I wanted to hear your talk. I'm very fascinated by what's going on and, and how that can democratize data. I'm in the ad industry, I'm a copywriter. And so oh, nice. I think a lot of people could use this who aren't data scientists. Oh, well said. I love hearing that. Uh, uh, thank you, Les. I, I, you know, I really think that's kind of the sweet spot for where this really appeals and has uh, so much impact is because, um, yeah, we, we have AI systems that are smart enough to train other AI systems. They're good enough, you know, and I mean, it, you're not trying to write a paper for NeurIPS, you know, or, or beat the next uh, Kaggle competition. Um, you're trying to get a job done and you need to get that done in a certain amount of time in your industry. Um, and you probably don't want to spend $20 million training a billion parameter model. <laughs> yeah, the basic thing in advertising is let's see something by five this afternoon. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and that's where this really helps. And, and you know, I think that there are energy considerations on this, policy considerations that if we can use the hardware effectively, we can train with less resources, which means less carbon footprint, uh, which also means faster results. Uh, to, to fit the business case. So I, I think that these, these kinds of, of you know, long-term goals are really aligning. Thank you. You know, the other thing I'll say is uh, I do have friends on, on some of those other teams, some of the cloud, cloud vendors uh, that were being mentioned, certainly on SageMaker. Um, so I'll, I'll shout out to them. Uh, there's a lot of great work across these, across uh, Google Cloud Platform, Azure, Alibaba, uh, AWS, IBM, et cetera. Um, you know, it's interesting because they, they really do leverage a lot of the open source. Um, there's kind of this pipeline from like research to open source to, you know, cloud offering uh, that, that's very active. So you can kind of get a feel for what's happening in the, in the research if you're looking at the papers, although more and more you can even get a leading signal by watching GitHub to see what papers are going to get published um, because probably the GitHub repo comes out before the publication. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a heads up for what's coming down the pipeline. Um, it, it does take time to create a, a robust service offering in the cloud. Um, I've, I've been working with Amazon since they launched and, uh, you know, to, to make something that's democratizing a new technology, but works in a very robust way for a large amount of people, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and so there's some lag between what the latest research is and what, what the latest offerings are doing, but these teams are doing really well to, to bring this out. Um, and it, it's, it's just, it's getting better over time. Any more questions from the audience?
Uh, let me ask one quickly. I, I regularly teach machine learning to practitioners, you know, applied machine learning, not algorithm engineering. And I always wonder how much this is going to change when auto ML goes mainstream. Like a lot of the typical curriculum, you know, uh, is focused on searches over algorithms, models, and hyperparameters. And these are the easiest parts to automate and the first parts to uh, become automated. Uh, what's your perspective on this? How much is this going to change teaching machine learning? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, just for some of my background, I led data teams in the industry for about 10 years. And so, um, you know, having to be the manager, the director level manager who's answering to executives, but also coaching a lot of people to be building machine learning uh, projects all day, every day. Um, it's a lot like teaching. <laughs> and I'll, I do some teaching on the side too. So I can really empathize. Um, you know, I, I think the big takeaway is that a lot of the stuff that we spent our time on was really busy work. It's just, it had to be done. It had to be done right. Um, it was something that clearly, even going back to 2011, you know, Stephen Boyd and others were pointing out a lot of this busy work could be done by machines. And then we can use our brain power, our communication skills, our social uh, abilities to understand the harder parts of the problem. Because I, I, I think that, you know, I, my, my experience teaching in industry, when I like going back to like 2014, I was doing a lot of uh, machine learning courses in the industry and uh, it still wasn't quite catching. It was only after that point where it really picked up. Um, but, you know, people were, were interested in the nuts and bolts. And if you talked about ethics, nobody wanted to hear about it. Um, you know, you talked about security and it's like, well, that's just too obscure. But these days, you know, we see what's happened over the past several years with large scale adoption of machine learning. And there are social considerations. There's a lot of huge impact on people. Um, so I, I think that, yeah, let's have machines do the busy work and let's focus on the hard problems involving security and privacy and collaboration and, and compliance and fairness, because these are things that can't be computed away. And they're also things that are just, they're organizationally very hard. And so we need people to understand other people and problems and history um, and law <laughs> uh, to be able to overcome some of those kinds of challenges. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that in some ways AutoML frees up the busy work so that we can take on the harder tasks. Um, I also, I work a lot in an area of uh, knowledge graphs, and this is something we're seeing in industry. Uh, actually, I work a lot with uh, some German firms in, uh, in uh, knowledge graph. And, uh, you know, this is the thing where they're trying to address uh, challenges in data across different parts of the organization. And it's a very human problem. Um, and it's not something that a machine learning model can solve. Um, so I, I, I like this idea that uh, people can be more people this way. Great answer. Uh, so Dennis is quickly asking, uh, can you make the slides available? Oh, or, uh... yes. Um, I, you know, I made some last minute changes. And so I will cut a PDF and post that. I can send it, mail it to you, or I can just post it uh, on the uh, on the meetup uh, comments. I think meetup comments work fine. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Paco. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Paco. Appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure.